this medal represents what the country has always stood for, sacrifice. My name's on the back of it, but it doesn't mean it belongs to me. I'm just a caretaker. It didn't matter where you were from or who you were, we looked out for one another. I felt this is what a soldier's supposed to do, and I still feel that way. But this medal's not mine. That belongs to uh, those kids who never grew up to be grandfathers. And I just hold it in trust. In 1861, as the bitter struggle of the Civil War escalated, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the creation of an award recognizing servicemen who would most distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action. Any nation, said the president, that does not honor its heroes will not long endure. At first, the Medal of Honor was intended only for Navy personnel, but soon after, a similar decoration was established for the Army. From its first presentation in 1863 through the creation of an Air Force Medal a century later, and up until the present day, fewer than 3,500 Americans have been chosen to wear this hallowed emblem, many posthumously. But the medal's rarity stands in stark contrast to its meaning, for common to each of the 40 million Americans who have faced combat for their country is the capacity for selflessness and service to others that is most nobly embodied in this, our nation's highest military honor. I was working at a bowling alley. I ran the restaurant at a bowling alley and we had a television and there came a very short clip of the president putting the Medal of Honor on Roger Donnelly. And he just, you know, standing so tall and so straight. And now, I, because of the military people in my family, I was very aware of what the Medal of Honor was. And I thought, wow. When I grow up, I'd like to be a soldier like him. Come World War II and my older brothers were off. And my first prayer that I can remember uttering in seriousness was that I would someday have the privilege and be able to grow up and serve. I had a brother who served in Korea. All four of my brothers-in-law were World War II guys. One was killed. Uh, so those were my heroes, it was family. I was liberated from the German camp by the 11th Armored Division. This was something you never forget. So I made a promise. Lord help me if I ever go to America, I'm gonna become a G.I. Joe. I grew up in a very small town and developed an appreciation of service to country. In a small town like that, every Flag Day, every Fourth of July, Veterans Day, there was always a parade in town, and I was quite impressed with that as a child. In 1952, I got a letter in the mail that says, Greetings, you've been selected by your friends and neighbors, and I was being drafted. And I went to kick hell out of my two friends and uh, then checked my neighbors, and none of them had done that. So if they ever do start the draft again, they got to change that letter. It's, it, that was. Uh, terrible way to find out that I was going in the service. I was drafted in 1950, and I was taught that uh, when you got drafted, you had to go, it was your duty. I didn't even know where in the heck Korea was. We had been warned about the problem of Okinawa. And the night before, we were told that the entire 1st Marine Division was expendable. That means that we're gonna lose everybody. I said, I don't know what Vietnam's like, because I'm the only non-returnee in this group. But if you'll trust me, I'll bring you all home. And then all hell broke out. Uh, they start firing right from the left to right behind us. And the only way we could get out was fight our way out. I mean, the war is now there, right now. All right, I said, Pete, for God's sakes, move your gun out. You're going to shoot the top of Bucky's head off. He says, we can't shoot, they just shooting at us. The uh, lead tank pulled up right beside my gunner. Now, I'm only 25 yards from, I stood up and looked him right in the face. They were that close to us and uh, you're laying there, you're thinking, this is it. We're facing old man death right in the face. All you could hear was guys moaning, calling for that mama, help me. There's nothing I can do. 
things get really, really rough. And there's a whole lot of explosions going around you, bombs bursting in the air and, and rifle, machine gun fire, all of that coming at you at one time. You're, you're, no one's exempt from fear. Of course you were scared. I was scared to death. But your responsibility is to lead your men into very dangerous areas on occasion and you have no choice but to do it. I'm a 19-year-old medic. And then by that time it's seen, I don't know how many people get killed. But I took a note to myself to help others because that's what I was, a medic. And they took obviously a note to come back and save me because we were there to take care of each other. What immediately came to mind was my little brother. It was just instinct. It's what I'd been taught. You don't leave your brother. And I went and got him. I made a decision to make a wheels up landing, crash close enough to his airplane, and pull him out of the cockpit. Someone yelled for me, and I looked down and fell on it. And I run up and I said, Come on, boy, let's get the hell out of here. I told the members of my squad to withdraw. In four hours, I knocked out seven of those things. Picked up Captain Gormley in my arms and brought him back. I felt something had to be done. I didn't even think about it just did it. Courage is not a lack of fear, which would be a lack of intelligence, but it's, it's how you handle your fear. It's kind of like the guy that runs into a burning building. He's not really thinking of all that's going to happen to him if he does it. He just does it because it's part of his, who he is. And I knew that if I died doing what I was doing, well, what better way to die? I mean, what better way for a soldier to die than to uh, be saving the lives of his fellow soldiers. Next morning, we got everybody out, and I saw my first uh, KIAs that were my men. And I remember thinking, I asked them to trust me, and I promised them I'd bring them home. Those 10 guys did, but I didn't. But I also learned that as a young officer, if you have the opportunity, the burden and the privilege to look a young man in the eye and ask him to go do something, and they know what you're asking them to do in all likelihood means they're not coming back. And these American soldiers look in the eye and they wink and say, got it, sir, and grab their weapon and off they go. And there's nothing in life that compares to that responsibility, nothing. Those of us that wear the Medal of Honor know that, that there are so many other soldiers, airmen, Marines, that have done acts that, that just weren't recognized that, because there were no witnesses left. So I'm very proud to be able to wear the Medal of Honor for all of those that, that performed deeds far greater than I did, that no one, no human being knows what they did. These examples of you know, ordinary people behaving in extraordinary fashion can uh, be inspiring, and they should be inspiring. I spent eight months in the Philadelphia Naval Hospital recovering from my wounds, and that's where I saw heroism. Our heroes are our nurses, so the volunteers who came in and laid a hand on you and said it was going to be okay. You know, the ones who went above and beyond uh, and let you know that they loved you. I really believe that you'll never truly lead anybody until you learn to serve and you'll never truly serve anybody until you learn that there's something more important than yourself. Those who know about it do appreciate it, but I don't think it's important to appreciate the medal or the living recipients. I think it's important for individual American citizens to understand how important sacrifice writ large is. And I think given the challenges that we have endured and the challenges that we are going to endure, that Americans do appreciate how much you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit, if you don't care if there's any recognition, and if you don't care um, what you do as long as you do something uh, positive. I think the American public does understand that. I didn't go to war to kill people. I went to war because I loved my daddy. I wanted him to be proud of me. I went to war because I loved my grandpas. And I loved my country. And when I got over there, the reason why we fought so hard was because we discovered we loved each other, that we were all we had. It didn't matter where you were from or who you were, we looked out for one another. And that same thing can apply to the United States of America. 
And ever since, take care of one another. And the squad is eight of us, and we all agreed that everybody would come back one way or the other. You learn brotherhood when you learn to live together and eat together and sleep together. You learn to trust people. That's the big thing. We're all the same. We're American.